Luke 16, verses 23 through 31, if you'd please stand as we show our honor and respect for the reading of God's holy word. It says, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thou good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into the place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. This is the word of God. Let us pray. Lord, we do thank you and praise you for your word this morning. And now ask that your Holy Spirit would tenderize the hearts of each and every individual that's here today. As we again for a second week look at this topic of hell. Lord, this real place that's just as real as heaven. Lord, I pray that if there be one here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior of their life, that today your Holy Spirit would strangely warm them. Today would be the day of salvation, and today they would take that step to be saved from an eternity in a place that they were never, ever created to go. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in this service today, that the living hope of your Son would be made clear. Lord, that this preacher would fade to the back and that you, Jesus, would come forward. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat this morning. There's a story of a chaplain. This is not JT, okay? There's a story of a chaplain that was stationed in the Middle East. And after a real rough time, this chaplain one day addressed his soldiers. And he said, Men, I have to tell you today, I no longer believe there is a hell. I no longer believe that there is a hell. Well, after the chapel service, the soldiers got together and they all talked amongst themselves. And they said, this isn't right. If there is no hell, that means that death is only a thing. And if death is only a thing, then we're living in this world without any consequences. So the soldiers got together and they met with the chaplain And they said to the chaplain, Sir, your services are no longer needed with us. And the chaplain was a little confused and scratched his head and said, Why is that? And he said, and the soldier said, Look, if you don't believe there is a hell and you're going to teach us that there is no hell, well, then nothing in this world matters. Nothing matters. But if there is a hell then, sir, you're now leading us astray. Either way, we're better off without you in a position of leadership. Listen to me, church. I tell you that story because, like I said last week, while we don't like the topic of hell, while we don't like the thought of hell, and we like to put that at the back of our mind, and any time you go to a funeral, you'll never hear anybody ever say that someone is in hell today... (laughs) Everyone's always in a better place. Listen to me. I can tell you on the authority of God's word, there is a place called hell. There is a place called hell. 
And just as you would warn a child about the dangers of fire, and just as you would warn a child about the dangers of sticking a fork in an electric socket, and just as you would warn a child about the danger of getting too close to snakes because they may bite you, and just as you would warn people of the dangers of cars and why you wouldn't cross the street without looking both ways, we must be warned, just like Jesus did with his people in his time, we must be warned about the dangers of hell. The reality of hell and the truth that one day without putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you could spend an eternity separated from God. Because when we die, we step into what we've been studying. We've been, you step into the afterlife. And listen to me, folks. Once you step into the afterlife, once you step into eternity, your choice as to where you're going to go is fixed. There's no, there's no hoping that someone that's still living prays you out of a situation. And there is no place called purgatory. You got two options, smoking or non-smoking. You got heaven or hell. Reality kicks in the moment that you take your last breath. And so continuing, last, or two weeks ago, we looked at what is hell. Today we're going to look at what is hell like. And in our text today, you get a description of the torment, the torment of what those who die without Christ will face for an eternity. And look, I'm not often a preacher that tries to scare you into hell, but I hope that this is one of those messages that when you read it and it's understood to you, listen to me, I hope it scares you to where you'll come to the altar and get saved. If you should get fear in your life at some point, if you're not a believer, it should be from this message. Not by what I'm preaching, but by what the text says. Because it's true. First thing I want you to see in verses 23 through 24 this morning is that hell is a place of physical torment. Hell is a place of physical torment. It says, in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment. Now remember, we're talking about the story that Jesus is telling here, right? Now it is a story. The story has the truths in it. Jesus wouldn't be telling the story if there weren't truths in it, all right? All right? And it talks about two people who died. One was rich and didn't have faith. One was poor and, didn't ha and had faith. The one went to Abraham's bosom. This is Old Testament. The one went to hell. And there was a gulf in between them. One could see to the other. They could talk to one another. All of that kind of stuff. We talked about this two weeks ago, or at the beginning of our series, all right? It says, and he lifted up his eyes, the rich man who died without faith, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Listen to me, church. The person who wakes up in hell can kiss comfort goodbye. The person who wakes up in hell can kiss comfort goodbye. Hell is a place of physical torment. Look at the passage again. It talks about physical torment. It says he lifted his eyes. It says he cried and said. He needed to have his tongue cooled. It's talking about physical things that we have even in this life that he is being tormented with in hell. And you're saying, well, Pastor Jeff, wait a second. I thought that the body went to the ground when we died. The soul goes either to heaven or hell. Yes. So what we actually have and what we can conduce from what Jesus is telling us here is that this is talking about the second death. This is talking about after Christ has returned, where even the dead who died without faith are resurrected again. And then in Revelation, it talks about how death and hell were thrown into the lake of fire, and that is the second death. That's what he's talking about here. Because listen to me, here's, here's one of the torments of, of hell, and, and that it's a physical torment. Look, we always think about, you know, when you go to heaven, you get a new body, right? <laughs> and our soul, right? will be 
when, 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 we, when the new heaven and new earth appear, our soul will reunite with our body and it'll be resurrected and it'll be renewed and we'll be back in a physical form. Folks, it's the same for those who died without Christ. Their bodies are going to be resurrected at some point. But listen to me, they won't be renewed. And their soul that's been in the holding tank will be reunited with a body that's decayed and rotten and fallen and sin infested and they will stand before God. And then that body, the old decrepit broken down body and the soul will be thrown into hell. Hence why there's physical torment going on here. We see that he still has all of his physical faculties. We see that this person is able to see, this person is able to talk, this person is able to feel, this person even thirsts. But listen to me. We sometimes get the idea of hell and flames bursting out, even bursting out of someone's bodies. But the Bible shows us that that's not a correct depiction, but rather flames are surrounding, right? That's the description that's given here. It's surrounding. It's creating a gulf. Notice it doesn't say that this guy wakes up and he's screaming his head off because he's in so much pain. It doesn't mean that flames are shooting out through him and he's on fire. Notice when he cries out to Abraham, he doesn't say, douse me with water. He says, I need a drip of water for my tongue. So it's not that you're engulfed in flames, but you're in an environment that is. And your body is taking in all of the agony that is from having so much heat around you. Notice, though, he's able to have an intelligent conversation. He's able to have a logical dialogue with Lazarus that's on the other side and in in Abraham's bosom. He's interacting with the person, yet he is in agony. He's functioning properly physical, but he's in a ton of pain. You know, the only thing I can compare it to, and, you know, again, drawing from uh, talking with JT at lunch the other day, I asked him, I said, what was the most difficult part of, of your time over in Kuwait? And he said it was the heat. 120 degrees some days. No end in sight. He said, we would plan our days in terms of when we had to go outside in full fatigues for certain amounts of time to go and do certain things. Imagine, folks, being in full fatigues and going outside in 120 degree temperature. Sun beating down on you. Oh, well, it's a dry heat. I don't care! It's torment. Now imagine never being able to go back inside. Constantly being in that. Any of us would say, if we did that for a prolonged period of time, what would happen? We would start to experience the torment of what comes from dehydration, overheating, all of that kind of stuff, right? You start hallucinating, all of those sorts of things, that torment that comes over you from being exhausted by the heat. Now imagine, listen to me, in this world, you can escape that by dying. Your body eventually gives out. But now you're in hell, and you're experiencing that, and there is no death. It just goes on and on and on. It doesn't get any better. There's no relief. In fact, it just gets worse and worse. It's physical torment on your body in a decrepit, sinful, fallen body, and there's no escape. Hell is a place of physical torment. Second, I want you to see that hell is a place of social torment. Look at verse 23. Again, and it says, And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Remember how we talked about hell being, we described hell as kind of being uh, Alcatraz. Remember the old prison of Alcatraz out in the San Francisco area? How it was surrounded by a body of water, and all that was on Alcatraz was that, that prison. And people, one of the torments of the prisoners was they could see out and they could see freedom, but they had no way of getting there. They could see relief, but they had no way of getting there. 
And if they tried to escape, they either, most prisoners wound up dying from exhaustion from trying to swim to shore, or they got eaten by the sharks that were in the water. There was no escape. Folks, it's a place of social torment. He could see. He could see the other side. He could see glory. He could see all that he had forsaken. He could see his freedom, but he couldn't get there. There was no way of getting there. It was a reminder of that for eternity. But can I tell you something else as to why hell is a place of social torment? Listen to me. Hell is not going to be the social party that all these people try to tell you it's going to be. Come on, we've all heard it before, right? Well, I don't care. I'm going to hell. That's where all my friends are going to be anyway. We're just going to party. <laughs> Folks, it's not going to be the social. Listen to me. When you go to hell and when you go to hell and when you're in hell, you will have no friends in hell. You will have no friends in hell. Take your Bibles. Go over to Isaiah 66, 24. We looked at this verse last week, but I want to reference it again. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 24. You get that double dose of hearing pages flip this morning, first from the hymnals and second from your Bibles. It's a wonderful thing as a pastor. Isaiah 66, verse 24. When I hear pages stop, I'll continue. I'll know you're there. It says, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. This passage is dealing with eternal torment. For their worm shall not die. Jesus talks about this in Mark 8, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Talking about those who are around them. Listen to me. The Bible tells us here that everyone who lives in hell will be an abhorrence to every other person who lives in hell. There's not going to be any partying. There's not going to be any hanging out. There's not going to be any comforting. There's not going to be any consoling. The only thing that's going to be there is the rotten, disgusting smell of decay There's also going to be panic, hence the screams and the yells of torment. There's going to be shame. Each and every person will finally see themselves for the sinful, heretical person that they are without Christ, away from the glory of God. Everyone will see themselves for the sin that they have and the opportunities they throw away. Folks, it's no longer a far-off thought that could be true. It's now a reality for each person that's there. And look, you're going to see someone coming in hell, and you ain't going to want to be near them. Why? Because they're going to stink. They're going to smell. Remember, it's the body coming up out of the ground. It ain't made new. It's still decaying. It's still rotten. My goodness, you may still have maggots and worms coming out of you. It's not going to be pretty. And not only that, but each and every person is trying to be getting away from things. The looks, the smell, it's going to be terrible. And not only that, but there is going to be a hate filled in each and every person. Why? Because they're there and because the Holy Spirit's not either. You say, well, Pastor Jeff, when they were living, they didn't have the Holy Spirit either. But you know what? No, you're right. The unbeliever does not have the Holy Spirit, but you know what kind of keeps this world together right now from kind of consuming itself? Is that the Holy Spirit is present in this world. Working on the hearts and the lives of people, trying to prick their conscience, trying to get them to open their eyes, trying to move and work. It's the Holy Spirit that's kind of holding all hell from breaking loose on earth together right now. Listen to me, in hell there is no Holy Spirit. It's all that pain, it's all that anguish. It's all unleashed. The full humanity or the full sin of humanity is unleashed and the full expression of sin is made known in hell amongst people. 
Listen to me, if heaven, everyone is at their best, listen to me, (laughs) in hell, everyone's at their worst. It's the exact opposite of heaven. And no matter how many people are going to be there, you're going to be alone. Some of it's the darkness. You'll hear someone rustling and you won't be able to see them and coming. You'll hear the moaning and the groaning you won't be able to see it. You'll smell someone and you won't want to be around anyone else. You'll have a bunch of people but you'll be alone. It's separation from God permanently. Never ever to be in the presence of God's love ever again. No more singing of hymns. No more gathering together like the church does on a Sunday morning. No family functions. None of that. Constant social torment. Not only is hell a place of physical torment and social torment, it's a place of psychological torment. Look at verse 25. It said, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Can I tell you, the hardest aspect of hell and the torment that will be in hell, the hardest aspect for you to comprehend today will be the psychological. The psychological. And that's because people in hell will remember for all eternity what they threw away. You know, I have people ask me all the time, Pastor, will you... Or when we go to heaven, will we remember those who got thrown into hell? Because the Bible says that we will see them being cast, bound hand and foot, into the lake of fire. And I, I'm guessing at that time, at the great white throne judgment, what it's known as, that when that time comes, you will have people, as they're being bound hand and foot, they will look at you and they'll say, why didn't you tell me? There will be crying, there will be agony, there will be tears on that day. But you know what? After that's all over with, it says that God will wipe every tear from our eyes. And what a lot of people believe is that that's God wiping away our memory. How can you enjoy an eternity of heaven with those images in your head? With those experiences coming with you? But while our memory will be wiped clean of that horrible experience, the memories of the people who are thrown into hell, they'll have them forever. Notice it says, remember. Remember that thou in thy lifetime. He's able to comprehend and look back. He's able to remember his mistakes. He's able to remember his errors. He's able to remember his regrets. He's able to remember every single thing that he wishes he would have done differently. And he has an eternity to ponder them. Go over to Mark chapter 9, verses 43 through 48. Mark chapter 9, verses 43 through 48. Again, we we looked at this passage a little bit last week, but I want to go back to it again. Mark chapter 9, verses 43 through 48, Jesus says, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Notice Jesus is referencing Isaiah 66 here. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Where their worm dieth not, And the fire is not quenched. By the way, the fact that Jesus is referencing cutting things off and and better to have not than to enter into hell with, again, refers back to the first thing of hell being a physical torment. You will have those physical things in hell. But what I want you to notice here, number one, is notice there's a phrase that's repeated three times by Jesus. And it comes directly from the Isaiah 66 passage. 
right? It says the fire never goes out. The flame never dies. It is an environment that is eternal and a torment that is psychological. How do I know this? Notice in the passage, there's something else he repeats three times. It says, where their worm dieth not. Where their worm dieth not. Again, Isaiah 66, 24, we see this. Two things you got to notice about that phrase. First, it's singular. Right? When Jesus talked about Gehenna, they understood, right? It was the, it was the dump outside, outside of the city, right? Where there were worms that were eating the decomposed trash and bodies that were thrown in there. But this says worm, folks. It's singular. Not only is it singular, but look, it says, and there... Right? Where their worm dieth not. Not those worms dieth not. Their worms. So it's connected to the individual. The worm is theirs and it's singular. What is that worm? Listen to me. I believe, I truly believe, and the authority of some other scholars, I did a lot of research on this, all right? Listen, the fire is the external, the fire in hell is the external pain and punishment that everybody's got to face when they're in hell. The worm is the internal. The worm is the internal. It's the thing that is in each and every person that is eating and gnawing on them like maggots on a carcass. Listen to me. When he says remember, He says, remember, he's referring to that worm. That worm that will be in you, eating you from the outside, or from the inside out. It's that psychological aspect, the memories, folks. The memories of Sunday in church when the preacher preached on hell and gave you a chance to accept Jesus Christ, and you felt the tug of the Holy Spirit on your heart, and you said, maybe another day. It'll play in your mind for eternity. You had the chance, and it slipped away. It was putting off every single opportunity when you heard the gospel preached and the chance to respond. It was putting off every single opportunity when you laughed about going to church and you told other people that they were wimps for going to church. It was, it was laughing, it was mocking, it was scorning, and now all of it's true! and you've got no place to turn, you're going to remember every single opportunity you had and how close you were, and you rejected it, and it's going to eat at you for eternity. That's why when the Holy Spirit nudges on your heart, when he pricks your conscience, you deal with it when he deals with you. You don't turn it down. Look at verse 25, because I, I believe it's, it, it's not just... It's not just the psychological of... It's not just the psychological of remembering each and every opportunity you had to be saved. But I think it's the psychological of every single thing that you battle with psychologically here that will be on full display in hell. It says, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Look, we talked about how there's different levels of hell, right? Everything on the outside's the same. The different levels come from your personal hell that's on the inside from this worm. And there are going to be things, listen to me, you don't get a renewed body in hell. So you're going down there with your genetic dispositions, your addictions, your shortcomings, your faults, your vices, the things that make you stumble, the sins that you struggle with, the things that you can't seem to put down. All of those things are going to be on full display. The Holy Spirit ain't going to be able to help you. He's not there anymore. Listen to me. And you won't have any escape from them. You won't be able to get away from it. Addictions will go unfulfilled. You know how painful it is when people go through withdrawal 
trying to get over drugs and alcohol, of desiring and craving and wanting something and not being able to have it, what do they normally do? They'll put their mind on something else. Well, what do you do in hell? There isn't anything else. All it is is a swampy, waste, uh, barren wasteland of fire and torment and disgustingness. There's nothing to take your mind off of your sins and your, and your sinful desires. There's nothing to take your mind or distract you from the addictions and the things that you want, except guess what? The addiction and the feelings and the pain is never going to go away and you're going to continue to have them and want them and desire them and there's going to be no rest. It's going to be psychological hell, folks. Literally. At least on this earth, you can satisfy those desires every once in a while by acting on them or fulfilling them. Ain't no chance for that in hell. There's no help. There's nothing to distract you. There's no peace, there's no goals, there's no schools, there's no jobs, there's no buildings, there's no construction. Welcome to life outside of the presence of God. Well, there's nothing. Absolutely nothing. When the goodness of God is removed, all you're left with is the wasteland of hell. Last but not least, I want you to see this morning, not only is hell a physical torment, a social torment, a psychological torment, but it's an eternal torment. It's an eternal torment. Verse 26, it says, And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. In other words, there's no moving. It's done. It's done forever. You know, Jesus has given us a picture here of what hell is like. The Bible says that hell eventually will be cast into a lake of fire and it will be surrounded. You will be surrounded in that lake of fire. There will be no escape. There's no chance of escape. Revelation 14.11 says that there will be no rest day or night. You know how in heaven there is no night? In hell there is no day. It just goes on and on. There's no seconds in hell. There's no minutes in hell. There's no hours. There's no days. There's no years. No millennia. It's like a clock on the wall without hands. It's useless because it doesn't matter. It's forever. And can you imagine being in a place like that and being able to see what's going on in heaven? You're going to be able to see glory, but not be able to get there. Folks, it's not a pretty picture. No one ever leaves. It's a life sentence. It goes on forever. Listen to me. If you are afraid of hell this morning, if anything that I have said has brought something to attention in your soul. Listen to me. Number one, don't shrug it off. (laughs) Number two, I I want you to know something. God offers a way for you to not go there. He offers a way for you to not go there. Look at verses 27 to 31. The rich man pleads for his family not to join him. You know, and that'll be some more psychological torment that's there, right? Especially when you die, when, when, you, when you go to hell when you die before all of this happens at the end of time. <laughs> will be crying out and not wanting your children to go there, not wanting your brothers, not wanting your family to go there, knowing you're there and they're on their way there and there's nothing they can do. Listen, l- listen to what he, what he cries out and what he tries to put into place. It says, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they come into this place of torment. In other words, take this dead guy, take, send Lazarus back and let him go and testify to my family 
so that way they don't have to come here. So that way they don't have to make the same mistake that I do. Please. Look at the response. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In other words, folks, listen to me. There will be no excuses of, I never heard the word of God. You have it. Right here is everything you need to know that is sufficient unto your salvation in Jesus Christ. They have Moses and the prophets. And not only that, church, how much more are we today without excuse? They had, he's referring to the Old Testament. We have not just the old, but the new. We have both. And if the Old Testament was sufficient, how much more today do we have in the new? With the Gospels, with the epistles. Not only that, look at what it says. Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, nay, father, Abraham. But, so in other words, no, the scriptures won't do. Check this out. But if one went unto them from the dead, then they will repent. If one went, if you send a dead person back to talk to them that's, that's come out, then they'll listen to that person. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And what'd they say? What'd he say? He said, and he said unto them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. In other words, folks, again, we have the authority of the word, the testimony of the word. But can I tell you something, church? While that request wasn't met by that person, for, or for that person, the request was met for you and me today. Praise God. God sent his son who died on a cross for our sins. He was the perfect atonement and he went into hell. He stole the keys from the devil as the old Baptist preacher would say. He took the people out of Abraham's bosom, took them home to glory. And guess what? A dead person came out of the grave and is alive and has testified unto you about his saving grace and about our Father. And he offers salvation to you. You just don't have this book, but you also have the thing that the rich man desired. You have the testimony of a man who died and rose again. And guess what? He's still alive. He beat death and hell. You don't have just one witness, you got two. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? As the worship team gets ready to come back up to play our final song, God offers you a way out this morning. Look, I believe that there's going to be two phrases that you're going to hear over and over and over and over and over and over and over again in hell. And it's going to be too late. And I only wish. Too late. And I only wish. Look, the Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart this morning. If you are not sure that you're saved, if you've never laid down your life to Christ, if you've never recognized that you're a sinner and you need a Savior, you can run around saying you believe in Jesus all you want. Guess what? The devils believe in Jesus too. The difference for you is that you've got to recognize you're a sinner and you cannot save yourself. You can recognize he's Lord, but is he your Savior? He came to save you from your sins. Your sins are the thing that will send you to hell if they're not paid for. Guess what? He paid for them. You just got to accept it. And you accept them by grace, through faith. Oh, how blessed we are to live in the church age. Not by works that any man should boast. Listen to me. You don't have to know what hell is like. 
The most you ever have to experience hell is how I preached it to you this morning and how God reveals it to you in Scripture and maybe some hot days over this summer. But you weren't meant to go there. All you have to do is come to God through faith in Jesus. He will forgive you your sins and you will receive eternal life. And you can call heaven your home. Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. We're going to sing a final song. It's called Grace, Grace, God's Grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sin. If you're here this morning, and you don't want to go to hell. I want to lead you in a prayer. These aren't magic words. We did this two weeks ago, but listen to me. I don't want you to miss the opportunity. You got to mean these things. You can't just recite them. It's not a magic spell. But you have to mean it in your heart. Just cry out to him this morning, Dear God, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to spend an eternity separated from you. I accept your payment and forgiveness of sins offered through your son, Jesus Christ. His death and his resurrection. And I ask him the best way I know how to save me. Amen. God does not want you to perish. That's why he sent his son. If that's you this morning, the altar is open. The altar is open as we sing this final song. Don't let the moment get past you. And Christian, maybe you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. Amen. Praise the Lord. But maybe you need to come down to this altar this morning because you need to recognize that you've got some witnessing to do, number one, because you've got family and friends that don't know Jesus. But number two, why don't you just have a little bit of a praise break as you realize this morning just what he saved you from. Sing 